This is an exciting chapter, the chemistry of life, an intro to organic chemistry and biochemistry, both of which are subjects that I deeply love, and one of which is the subject in which I obtained my PhD, that being organic chemistry, not, not biochemistry, although I love both of them. <sighs> anyway, so I don't have anything funny to tell you guys to start off. I'm just going to get right into it. After this series of lectures in, that will cover an intro to OCHEM, you guys should be able to explain how organic chemistry got its name, explain how organic chemistry is used, and determine any carbon atoms, bond, angle, molecular geometry, and hybridization. Define the following terms, alkane, alkene, and alkyne. Calculate a hydrocarbon's number of degrees of unsaturation. Sort different hydrocarbons by polarity. Convert any longhand chemical structure into a line bond structure. Produce IUPAC names for simple alkanes. Know what an enantiomer and a stereocenter or chiral center are and why they're relevant. And note that we'll skip section three. It's a huge lineup and it might seem overwhelming, but trust me, by the time we're done, you will be able to do this stuff. So let's go ahead and get started by answering the question, what is organic chemistry? Well, because the word organic is used contemporarily to mean things like all natural, free from artificial ingredients, or environmentally friendly, some people mistakenly think that organic chemistry is somehow the environmentally friendly branch of chemistry. Unfortunately, that is generally untrue. Okay, I'm not saying that organic chemistry is environmentally unfriendly or is environmentally friendly. I'm just saying that as far as environmental friendliness is concerned, it's not any more or less friendly to the environment than any of the other branches of chemistry, really. So what is organic chemistry actually? Well, to simply define it, organic chemistry is actually the study of carbon-containing compounds. That's pretty much it. And while I realize that carbon is only one element on the periodic table and might therefore seem unworthy of receiving so much extra attention, as it turns out, carbon is extremely important, especially for the existence of life on Earth. Hence, there was once a time when scientists believed that all molecules produced by living or organic organisms were comprised of carbon, and all molecules derived from non-living things, such as rocks and dirt and stuff, were carbon-free. This is where the field of organic chemistry, the study of carbon and carbon-containing compounds, got its name. Now, this initial belief was proven false in 1828. It just so happened that there are tons of molecules in non-living things that also contain carbon, as well as some molecules in living things that don't, such as water, which is just H2O. <laughs> okay, so what is organic chemistry good for? Well, in practice today, organic chemistry is the field of chemistry that specializes in assembling molecules, most frequently medicines. So, many of us organic chemists are in reality Drug makers. <laughs> Not illegal drugs, just, just good drugs. We leave the illegal drugs up to bad people. Okay, so anyway, pharmaceutical companies as a result have armies of organic chemists under their employ, most of whom work like orcs in their company's research labs and basements. <laughs> See, there's a picture of me in grad school. I think my complexion has changed a little bit as I've gotten older. <laughs> anyway, so at this point you might ask, so how do organic chemists assemble molecules? I mean, molecules are tiny. How do you do that? That's a good question. The way we assemble molecules is by starting with simple molecules, which we often call starting materials, that we can buy and then alter them one step at a time by using very specific chemical reactions. Hence, organic chemists have to learn hundreds of different synthetic reactions, which allow us to convert our cheap, readily available starting materials into complex molecules with useful properties. In effect, then, organic chemistry is kind of like playing with Legos, trademark. For any of you who have played with Legos, trademark, you might realize that what you see on the box, such as this picture, which I stole off of the internet, is not what you see when you open the box. When you open the box, you have all these tiny little pieces. How do you turn the tiny little pieces into what is shown in the picture on the box? By putting them together one step at a time. In the case of this farmer with his cute little watering hole and his dog and his pig, you'd put them together according to these instructions, which I also stole from the internet. You begin by taking this block and adding these pieces to it, and then those pieces, these pieces, those pieces, and then you bring in the farmer and his animals. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. So similarly, we can assemble molecules one step at a time by putting pieces together. Unlike Legos, trademark. However, we can't do this with our hands because molecules are small. Instead, we use very specific chemical reactions. Let me show you an example that comes from my years of experience in graduate school. We began in our research with this molecule, 
molecule one, which I have to explain a little bit. In the world of organic chemistry, you will learn soon, each of these points right here represents a carbon atom. So for example, this is a carbon atom right here that is double bonded to a carbon atom here to its left. It's single bonded to a carbon atom up top, and it's single bonded to another carbon atom right there. This is a carbon atom that's bonded to an oxygen to the right and three hydrogens to the left. This is a carbon atom double bonded to an oxygen. This is a carbon atom out here at the point. For any of the carbon atoms shown, ex with occasional exceptions like this one here to the left, we usually don't draw hydrogens. It's understood then that there are hydrogens there, as many as are needed, for each carbon atom to obtain four total bonds. Make sense? Whew, good. Anyways, it turns out this molecule is actually one that we can buy from a uh, chemical supply company, such as Fisher Scientific, which is the Walmart of the chemistry world. And if I treat this molecule, which is once again cheap and readily available under these conditions, I can convert what molecule one into molecule two. Kind of like Legos, trademark. You'll notice that molecule two looks very much like molecule one, except it's just slightly different. You might also wonder how we knew that treating this molecule one under these conditions right here would turn it into molecule two. The answer is because we know lots of organic chemistry reactions. In other words, the answer is the magic of organic chemistry. You might also notice that this reaction proceeded in a 98% yield, which is pretty good. At this point, we took molecule two and treated it under these conditions to convert it into molecule three. Molecule three was then manipulated further using these conditions to turn it into molecule four. This gave, by the way, a 76% yield over two steps for molecule two. Molecule four was then treated under these conditions with a magical catalyst whose structure I'm not showing here because it's really big. It actually is the or was the primary focus of most of my research in graduate school and turned four into molecule five. You might notice that the only difference between four and five is that there's one single carbon atom coming off right here. You also might notice that this carbon atom looks a little bit thicker than the other carbon atoms. What that means is that three dimensionally, that carbon atom is coming out of the screen and pointing towards you, as opposed to being flat in line with the plane of the screen, which is what it would be like if it were just a flat line, or if it were a dashed line, that would mean that it was pointing three dimensionally away from you. As it turns out, the three dimensional direction in which different bonds point actually plays a very crucial role in a lot of medicine's bioactivities, which we'll talk about later. Molecule five at the end was then treated under these conditions to uh, convert into this molecule, which is known as s naproxen generically, or also as uh, several different trademark names, including Aleve, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, or NSAID. So this is work that, once again, I participated in in my graduate research. If any of you guys want to read more about it, you can find it at this reference where we published our findings. <laughs> so hopefully you can see the analogy. Organic chemistry involves beginning with simple starting materials that you can buy and then manipulating them using special chemical reactions that we learn one step at a time to convert them into more complex molecules that hopefully have some utility, often medicinal properties. In this sense, then, organic chemistry is kind of like playing with Legos. Now, in case any of you guys are curious, my research now in my research lab centers on inventing new chemical reactions for organic synthesis and on synthesizing natural molecules with potential medicinal properties. That brings us to another conundrum. Many people are completely ignorant of the fact that probably 99% of all medicines, and that's probably not an exact number, I'm sort of pulling that out of the air a little bit, but it's probably pretty close that we buy and use are made or were invented, or the means for which they're made were invented by organic chemists. But wait, you might say, don't we get a lot of our medicines from nature? Yes, we do. However, most medicinally useful molecules made by nature are found in such tiny amounts out in nature that we can't get enough of them from nature to actually treat disease. Hence, natural product chemists discover medicinally useful molecules from nature, and then organic chemists develop ways of making those exact same molecules in the lab on large scale and hopefully in an affordable and efficient way. I'll now illustrate this by telling you a story that involves our molecule of the day. This molecule is called paclitaxel. A paclitaxel, known commercially as Taxol, trademark, as well as some other names, is a mitotic inhibitor used in cancer chemotherapy, isolated from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. Parenthetically, I mentioned that if you have or know anyone who's received cancer chemotherapy cocktails for treating cancer, it's very likely that this was one of the ingredients in them. Now, because it takes 1.3 tons of yew bark to get 10 grams of Taxol, which is a relatively small amount, it's the size of maybe a golf ball or so, and doing this kills the tree. An alternative means of obtaining large amounts of Taxol, trademark, had to be developed. In time, a compound called 10-diacetylbacotin, whose structure is shown here, 
was found. It's made by the European yew tree, which is a cousin of the Pacific yew tree. Tenviacetilbacatin can be harvested from the tree's needles, which grow back without killing the tree. Now I pause here to mention, hopefully you can see the structural similarities between the two. Tenviacetilbacatin looks almost exactly the same in its core as Paclitaxel, with a couple of modifications here and there. The major ones being this OH right up here in the upper left-hand quadrant, and Tenviacetilbacatin has this acetyl group attached to it up here in Paclitaxel. Furthermore, in tendiacetilbacatin, this OH over here has been replaced with an oxygen attached to all of this exciting stuff over here in Paclitaxel. Other than that, at their cores, they're pretty much identical. And once again, you can obtain tendiacetilbacatin in large renewable amounts, whereas Paclitaxel, you have to kill the tree, and the tree never grows back, and you're pretty much done. So anyway, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, Robert A. Holton, an organic chemist from Florida State University, devised and patented a way of synthesizing paclitaxel from 10 diacetylbactin, thereby providing a scalable means of making large amounts of this special anti-cancer medicine. As an aside, I should mention that I've been told that a good chunk of Florida State's football team budget is paid for, or was once paid for, by the royalties from this patent. I have no idea if that's actually true. Now, I should mention that Paclitaxel today is synthesized using genetically modified bacterial fermentation, which is a very cutting-edge technology that doesn't involve organic chemistry. But it is uh, sort of one of those exceptions. If you want to know more about that, you're welcome to look it up online. The point of my sharing this molecule is the idea that nature rarely makes medicinally useful molecules in large, renewable, huge amounts for us to use as human beings to treat disease. Therefore, it remains up to us, the organic chemists, and other scientists as well, to devise means of being able to synthesize and prepare these medicines in large, efficient, and scalable amounts. And organic chemistry is typically the way in which this is initially, and often in the long term, done. So, why is carbon so cool then? Well, in its most stable form, carbon always likes to make four covalent bonds, which it can do by forming single, double, or triple bonds, as we show here. This carbon, of course, has four single bonds around it. This carbon has one carbon-carbon double bond and two carbon-hydrogen single bonds around it. And these carbons have one carbon triple and one carbon-hydrogen single bond. Hopefully you're cool with that. So in effect, carbon is so cool because it's much more versatile than a lot of other elements because it can make all of these different kinds of bonds and as a result, plays a central role in forming a variety of very structurally complex molecules, especially molecules that are found commonly in living systems, including us. So that's sort of my intro to OCHEM for today. And it is the conclusion of this first video. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll begin teaching you more in depth about organic chemistry, including why carbon is so cool. Until next time, have an enjoyable rest of your day.